we're going to talk about IR Vision basic com concepts, proper lighting setup for IR Vision. Now let me start out by saying that we're, we're covering basic concepts here. Uh, there are many professional resources you can access to learn more uh, about advanced machine vision lighting, and I, I would like you to make use of my contact information that we'll, I'll show again at the end of the, sem uh, the webinar. Uh, you can contact me directly. I'd be happy to direct you to more information. But this is some basic concepts designed to get you started correctly with IR vision. And one thing I want to I'd also point out is that the uh, concepts that we're talking about are not necessarily unique to IR vision. This is an issue of lighting that has plagued machine vision ever since the uh, first machine vision system was set up. So we're going to talk about first an overview of machine vision illumination, then uh, a whole bunch of design characteristics for machine vision lighting that I expect will help you, again, get started with your next IR vision application. And then I have a few slides on tips and hints uh, that will hopefully get your uh, thought processes going even further. So to start out with an overview of machine vision illumination, what is lighting for machine vision? Is it a science or is it an art? Pretty much every lighting discussion in machine vision starts out with this kind of uh, weird question. Because the physics of illumination is well known. How many of you recognize the illustration to the right there as uh, the formulae for ray tracing in computer imaging? That's okay if you didn't, because I didn't either. I got that off the internet. But uh, that points out that illumination is seriously well known as a uh, law of physics. However, how lighting reacts with our parts in the real world for machine vision imaging can only be theoretically designed based upon our own technical expertise. And then, don't forget the most important part, carefully test that illumination to make sure it works with your application. Is it all the totally theoretical? No. We don't want you to just start aiming lights at a part, putting your hand in front of the I imaging, and decide from that how illumination works. And that's why we're giving this basic uh, fundamental course on illumination, so that you can have a better starting point to scientifically get some concepts down that will help you choose the best approaches for illumination. I'm going to start you out with a question here. How would you illuminate this shiny sphere or ball bearing? What would you do to correctly get it illuminated so that you could accurately measure the diameter? And what if you had to guide a robot to pick, up, uh, to pick the part up from the uppermost tangent of the sphere? This is a classic problem. There, is a good, there are a couple of good solutions, and I'm going to let you think about that through the course of the webinar. And at the end, I'll give you an answer, and hopefully it's the same answer you came up with after learning all about machine vision lighting. So why do we need proper illumination? Globally, everybody involved in machine vision and imaging agrees with this first statement, that the sensor, the camera, optics, lenses, and the illumination, this combination of imaging components, contributes 80% or more to the success of any application. That includes your application. That includes your next application. The, pro the issue is that problems in an image often cannot be overcome with software tools. We get poor lighting. We get poor imaging. We get confusing scenes and then hope to overcome those in the software tools, and unfortunately, that's sometimes a fool's errand. Let's look at these three images down at the bottom. To the lower left, we have a pretty confusing scene. Imagine trying to extract just one of those uh, wiring harnesses or one of those connectors or one individual component out of that scene that we need to actually measure measure and verify for, uh, for uh, presence, absence, or, or uh, tolerances. It's a difficult scene and requires some cha uh, either challenging image, imaging or some uh, real creative lighting. The part in the middle is a welded part on a uh, surface, and you see that the image here has been designed so that the lighting is not consistent at all across the image, uh, across the part itself. 
what's this going to do in the in the future as we get to as that as this uh, part uh, goes through changes through illumination changes through surface changes it's not going to provide a consistent lighting environment and then over to the right we see some dunnage with uh, both finished and unfinished gear teeth in it uh, and gears in it and what happens is in this case that the uh, illumination at least at this point of a preliminary evaluation has been done so that there's an excessive amount of light at the top and not very much um, a light at the bottom of the image. Once again, a, a recipe for a real challenge when it comes to trying to extract those features, being the gears and the, uh, the finished and unfinished gears, from that image. So I want to, I want to impress upon you that it's, uh, that it's these things that we have to overcome as we talk about the need for proper illumination. Quick question, what is the one thing that's required in order for any camera to capture an image? It's a trick question. The answer is lighting. Our eyes, a camera sensor, or anything that takes an image or extracts image information from our real world has to rely on light. Light, uh, nothing can happen if there's not some electromagnetic spectrum being reflected off of a part or off of a scene. So continuing on, let me define image quality for you. Uh, it's maybe not exactly what you think of when you think of image quality as we discuss it in terms of machine vision illumination. Image quality is, by definition in our industry, the correct image resolution for the target application with the best possible contrast between features that are important to the inspection and the rest of the confusing image background. Now, image resolution is something that's handled by your camera, so we're not going to talk about that in this particular uh, in this particular uh, webinar. However, uh, what we are going to talk about is how lighting impacts that best possible contrast. A lot of people call this also image signal to noise, and if you think about it, you can see how that kind of works. Im the signal being the features of interest for the guidance or the inspection, and the noise being all the other unrelated features, confusing features, and even varying image backgrounds. So we'll refer to it in both ways, but that's what we think of when we think of and talk about image quality. So when I, think, when I mention image quality, refer back to this concept, and you'll understand what I mean with respect to machine vision. How about a couple of machine vision lighting and imaging myths? These are great because I hear them all the time. People think, sometimes think that both, uh, that both of these or these and things like it are actually true in machine vision lighting and imaging. The first one is great. If you can see it, the camera can see it. I really do hear this out in the, uh, out in the plant, on the plant floors, and it can't be further from the truth. Why is that? Think about your eyes. Even if you're looking at a grayscale image, like the one I'm showing here below, your uh, vision is able to extrapolate the information on that image. And let's say we're holding a part in front of us, or holding some object in front of us. Not only can we extrapolate information from that object based on, our, based on our stereo view and our intuition about all the objects that we know of in our brain, we can also slightly tweak around the position of that part until the lighting uh, reflects off of that part just perfectly to provide the information we need. Can a camera do that in real life? Yeah, maybe, but it makes for a very difficult application. Normally we're stuck with a fixed camera position and all we're seeing is gray level information. Think about how you can decide, looking at that image, what features are actually in the foreground and what features are actually in the background? What features are in front of other features? You can even use that information to uh, imagine uh, sizes of features, uh, position of features, location of features, and you don't need very much contrast to do it. Cameras do. A corollary to this is that the, uh, is people who say, well, the image should look good. In other words, did you get a good looking image for your machine vision application? The answer is you don't need a good looking, looking image. In fact, most great images for machine vision don't look good to us as humans at all. All, they, all the goal is, is to extract those targeted features, the foreground features that we're interested in, relative to, to the confusing background. Another great one is, is existing lighting is enough for most applications. Well, we're going to learn as we go through here that existing lighting, or what we also call ambient lighting, the lighting that's coming in from the plant floor up above and from skylights letting the sunlight in, 
Um, the ambient lighting is more of a foe than a friend in machine vision applications. Now, actually, I'm going to go out on a limb here as we go through and say that maybe there are cases where ambient lighting is good enough. And I think I want to define those specifically for you so that you, but at least you'll understand the challenges of overcoming ambient lighting. So, in, in, in uh, conclusion here with respect to uh, lighting for IR vision, what do we need to do as goals? We need to create a high quality, quality image per our definition. We need to overcome or eliminate the effects of ambient light as needed. And we need to provide consistent image results over broad changes in part presentation or part appearance. This is a big one. We deal with lighting for robotic guidance. And even if it's an inspection application, it usually involves a robotic presentation of a part or a robot working with the part within our field of view. This poses some really special considerations and some uh, very important challenges to us as machine vision professionals in robotic guidance and in the robotic industry. The first thing is, as I just alluded to, is the coverage area and the working distance. We've got some huge robots to work with. Now, maybe not all of you work with these huge robots uh, that you see that I'm showing in the pictures down below. But in any case, most robotic applications require us to look at a fairly large field of view and that the camera and the lighting units be out of the way of the robot at uh, pretty um, extreme working distances in some cases. Of course, we can mount the camera on the end of the arm, but what happens then? We're now li we, we get maybe a closer field of view, but now we're extremely limited in the kind of lighting we can carry with the camera. So, of course, this is all application specific, but think about how, think about your challenges as you go into your next application and how they differ from the uh, inspection type of machine vision where we're just putting a machine vision camera and lighting on a, on a simple conveyor. In robotic guidance, particularly, there's variation in part position. Why? Well, that's the whole purpose of guiding a robot to pick up a part. We want that flexible automation. We want to be able to move that robot to positions where the part is, uh, to varying positions where the part might just show up and be able to accurately find it, accurately pick it up. The part may even be presented in different orientations. It may be laying on one side one time, one side another time. And of course, the, the big one, appearance of the part, surface appearance, or sur appearance of the features of the part. A lot of us work in industries involving metal, involving uh, uh, machined parts, and these parts are notorious for having a wide variety of surface appearance that uh, can inhibit the, the, our uh, challenge to get a good quality image. Why? Because they, they, reflect, they reflect light in all sorts of ways, and their position and their presentation may even change from image to image. And of course, it's pretty common to have confusing backgrounds in the robotic industry. It sounds great if we're going to put a part on a conveyor, let that conveyor move the part in front of our robot and have our robot pick, pick the part up. But what happens in real life? Oil, dirt, uh, other uh, defects occur on that surface of that conveyor, and all of a sudden what started out as a nice, clean, white, red, or green conveyor turns into a pretty dirty and confusing background. Illumination can help us uh, overcome that kind of confusing background and other confusing backgrounds on the plant floor. How are we going to do this? I'm going to start you with the basic physics of light. Now don't get afraid because we hear the word physics. I'm just going to go over some of the basics because you need to keep all of this in your mind as you're thinking about what light's going to do to your part as you try to design uh, machine vision uh, application, uh, design illumination for your machine vision application. So let's go back. This is a review of some high school physics. Light is both absorbed and reflected to some degree from all surfaces. We can see to the image at the right where we have a light source. That's just a single ray of light. Uh, of course, in a real light source, you have an infinite number of uh, major rays coming out of that light source and specularly reflecting from the surface of an object. Some of that is absorbed, as I mentioned, and uh, also refracted, depending on the material. I guess most materials will reflect, to refract to some, uh, to some degree. That means bending the light to a certain amount. Uh, 
And some surface or some objects, and actually the scientists may even tell me that most objects will actually transmit light waves, transmit photons to some degree. So, but what, what I want you to think about primarily is this idea of the light source and the specular reflection. And if you remember just one formula with respect to lighting, and I think this is the only one you need for for machine vision lighting in particular, is that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. In other words, the angle of the main ray of illumination, the, specular, the specularly reflected, the main ray of illumination onto a part, is reflected off of that part at the same angle as it came in. This is important as you, again, think about what you're going to do with your parts. Now, the one thing we haven't mentioned is this diffuse reflection. Diffuse reflection happens on most surfaces because most surfaces are not perfect. Even at a microscopic level, there are small anomalies, small uh, indentations, uh, whatever, t whatever type of uh, imperfections on the surface of the part, of the surface of the object that cause diffuse reflection. One um, major uh, difference, or one major uh, uh, deviation from that is, of course, a perfect mirror. A perfect, and in fact, it'd have to be a perfect front surface mirror. A mirror uh, that is perfect, again, with no surface anomalies whatsoever, is highly specular, in fact, totally specular, with no diffuse reflection. So if we, saw, if we shown, uh, shine our light source at a mirror, as we show in this image, all of the light would go off in a specular reflection, and a camera, a camera located above that part would see nothing but black. Uh, an example of other surfaces that are highly diffuse, I'm sure you can come up with many of them. In fact, most of the surfaces we deal with in, the, in, in our normal everyday life have a, a fairly high degree of diffusion. That is, their surfaces are not perfectly smooth, and they reflect light, the, the small uh, Small in, imperfections in the surface reflect light in a variety of ways. A good example is a piece of paper. It seems smooth to us, but it's actually highly diffuse. And if you shine a light at an angle on a piece of paper, it's very likely you're going to get a lot of light shining back vertically, even though still a lot of the specular reflection is going off to the right. So with that background in lighting physics, I want to go into design characteristics for machine vision lighting. And this is a, a difficult topic to get one's hands around, even in term, not just in terms of understanding, but also in terms of just presenting it. I've come up with, and with some uh, kudos to uh, uh, Advanced Illumination, uh, Daryl Martin, come up with some four basic func uh, characteristics of illumination that we can kind of uh, subcategorize uh, illumination sources, illumination styles, illumination techniques into that help you guide your uh, design for machine vision lighting for your application. The first one is geometry. By geometry in this case, we mean the spatial relationship to the object with the lighting and the imager. And we'll go into that a little bit more, quite a bit more. Structure of the light, the physical shape of the light source, and the type of illumination. There are a couple types of illumination. You may be even more aware uh, that they uh, had differentiation. Then also the wavelength or color of the light. And then finally, uh, things we might do to filter the light. In other words, manipulate that illumination by using external optical components. And uh, we'll touch upon these now in the rest of our presentation in some detail. Starting out with lighting geometry. Again, what this means is uh, the position of the light source relative to the part and the camera. This is probably the most important thing you can come away with in terms of beginning lighting design for machine vision. What is the geometry of the light source relative to the part in the camera? Not every light will succeed put up, uh, have being mounted around the camera as a ring light. And by the same token, not every light will succeed down uh, at the level of the conveyor. We need to understand how light works, thinking back to our physics of light, and then also understand, as we can see in my image here, what the camera does with that light. So the design considerations are, first of all, Big question, what is the direction of the reflected light ray? Second, and we'll talk about this in a minute, what reflected light is actually returned to the camera? And we've just learned that that could be relative to the surface of the part as well. 
And I advise that, as I mentioned before, that when you're thinking about this in its most raw terms, start by thinking of a mirror as the surface. So another question as we go forward into this lighting geometry, what is the size of the area as designated by the blue line up there at the top of this lighting W? Okay, think about this for a second. We have again, this is a W rep that represents light path. Remember, the camera is only working with reflected light off the part. Light is required to take an image of anything, even our eyes to take an image of something. So the camera is only working off a light path. And what happens with a light path? Angle of incidence equals angle of reflect reflection. So while different optical uh, uh, components, different lenses, will certainly have different optical angles, the point is that at their, it, once we extend that angle to the edges of the field of view, the angle of incidence at the edge equals the angle of reflection. And if you uh, can, you can in, by intuition, without even calculating that, see that at the top of the W, once the, li once the light gets back to the camera, the lighting area, the area that has to be illuminated to cover that entire field of view consistently is twice the field of view. In other words, we have two Vs of identical size, which are also the size of the field of view. You can see it from the image. Important thing to remember, anything that's in the camera field of view up above it and behind it that is anywhere within that W is going to be visible on a reflected surface within the field of view. And that comes into play a lot in machine vision applications. So thinking about that, the position of that light in, the, in that W, we have uh, one form of lighting that's widely accepted as being defined as bright field illumination. I like to call it more accurately light that's at a high angle of inc incidence relative to the camera. Look at those two light sources. We have light sources within the inside of the uh, main specular reflected area of the uh, W of the camera field of view. We've got lots of rays. I show a couple rays of light coming from those. And basically what happens is that most of the light coming from those light sources, if there is some reflection on the surface of the part, most of the light goes right back into the camera. Even if it's a hot spot that you don't want, it's going to go back into the camera. Sometimes this is exactly what you want if you have the right type of object underneath. Remember, at the surface of that object, the surface of that field of view, you certainly also have diffuse reflection. I don't want to uh, bypass that at all. I just want to show you how this bright field illumination creates a field of bright light because most of the specular reflection is going down onto the field of view. By comparison, if we put that light source outside of the uh, nominal reflected area of the camera based on its angle of field of view, the light source, the primary rays of light from that light source will bounce off of the uh, field of view and out into space. That's the path of specular re reflection in this case, and you can see what happens. Most of the light that is going onto that part, uh, most of the main rays of light going onto that part get reflected off into space and never reflected back into the camera. What does get reflect reflected back into the camera is anything that happens by diffuse reflection off of the surface of the part. Uh, or from edges or features that are on the part. So this light, this dark field illumination is also called, or is a little more correctly defined as putting the light at a low angle of incidence relative to the angle of the field of view of the optics of the camera. How do we use these? Uh, there, there are, you know, of course, hundreds of ways to use, these, use this kind of uh, knowledge. And this is the reason I'd like to give you this basic knowledge so that you can creatively imagine what to do with your light source positioning in future applications. We have a bright field illuminator to the uh, bright field illumination scheme to the left and a dark field illumination scheme to the right. Let's see what it does to this quarter. On the top, the 
reporter is completely, and in this case, thank goodness, uh, probably for our application, it's uniformly illuminated because we have the light shining directly on the part and all of that light's coming back into the camera by specular reflection. The only reason we have a little bit of shadow around George Washington's head there is because the light source is slightly offset from the camera. So each portion of that light is creating a little bit of shadow around George Washington's head because that's, of course, if you remember, think of a quarter, that's a raised object. Um, if we, uh, there are techniques that we'll talk about a, a little later that we could actually make that uh, object with that geometry on it, that quarter, almost an invisible, almost look like a, a contiguous circle without the uh, features being obvious. On the uh, lower image, we see the uh, quarter illuminated by just a single light source at a low angle of incidence. I bet you can guess which direction that light's coming from. Think about it. It's coming from the right of the quarter because that's where the light, you can see the light actually causing specular reflection off the geometric structure of George Washington's back of his head there. But in general, what the low angle light source is doing is highlighting geometric features and uh, anomalies in the surface. If you look closely, we can see little dents and scratches that have occurred to that quarter, even on the uh, rough, even on the smooth, what seems to be the smooth surface of the quarter. So a quick question, which I think you got the answer for already, what lighting geometry would highlight a scratch on a mirror or on a piece of glass? It sounds like a difficult application, but it really, if you know lighting and you know the way to achieve this kind of illumination, it turns out to be really easy. Of course, a low angle illuminator, a dark field illuminator does a great job of highlighting scratches and even eliminating other features on that surface of that, uh, surface of that object, be it glass, mirror, or even a shiny piece of metal. Okay. I'm not going to go into uh, the the, uh, let's say, dozen or so different uh, unique ways to shine light on a part. I'll show you some light sources in a minute that will give you a little bit of an idea. But the one thing I do want, the, the other lighting source I do want to mention is backlighting. Why do I want to concentrate on this versus all of the kind of more unique uh, lighting applications? The reason is, is that this can be extraordinarily valuable for a robotic guidance application. If you're able to backlight a part, you get a clean image of the part that highlights all of the features. Uh, even if parts are touching, you can usually overcome that, uh, that challenge. Uh, maybe not every time, but you usually can overcome that challenge and get an accurate image of the part uh, of the edges of the part. Even if the part is semi-translucent, depending on the lighting, uh, the light color that you select, you may be able to get a nice profile of the part over backlighting. And I point out a couple of things, uh, a couple of products here. Uh, I'm not promoting any particular product, but the point being that um, in traditional machine vision outside of the robo robotic guidance environment, uh, backlighting is pretty common. Why? Because you can get a, you can put in that nice little backlight right behind the part, put the camera in front of it, and do it uh, pretty easily. Again, we have challenges in robotic guidance. Parts are laying on things. Parts are laying on conveyors sometimes. Cameras have to be way in the air and backlights can't just be uh, six inches by six inches inside, in size usually. Uh, lighting, backlighting a conveyor is not that hard a thing uh, and in fact you can buy commercial conveyors that have backlights incorporated. I'm not trying to promote any particular conveyor or conveyor company. I'm just pointing out that this is a technology and a, and a use of lighting that a lot of people don't consider that is actually very viable and very useful. Thing to consider and the thing to remember in terms of backlighting, remember I mentioned that uh, most backlighting applications can uh, differentiate, differentiate parts even if they're most slightly touching or to a certain extent touching. Where does this get confusing? Well, um, backlight, back, uh, backlighting uh, a part causes the light to do one more thing that's a physical constraint of light that we didn't add in our first physics lesson there, and that is light will bend around an object. It diffracts. Light diffracts around an object. So you can see my two images here. The picture of, on the left is a, a small electrical component without light diffraction. The picture on the right is one with illumination diffraction. It's going to happen, and there's not 
not, I can't really tell you in a broad sense how to overcome that. There are some very, there are some high-end uh, illumination devices, telecentric and collimated devices that will overcome diffraction to some extent. But I just want you to be aware that this is the kind of image you're going to get with most um, with most backlit uh, applications, and I think we can overcome that uh, in our uh, in our processing. So how do we achieve this lighting uh, in our uh, in our everyday application? Well, fortunately for us, in the last 15 or 10 to 15 years, there's been a real proliferation of uh, lighting companies that provide very creative light sources for use specifically in machine vision. And I'm just showing a few here on the screen. We have uh, uh, domes, we have linear illuminators, we have ring illuminators, bar illuminators, spot illuminators. Uh, all of these are uh, widely in use in machine vision for, uh, for lighting uh, in, in our various applications. Again, as you look at these, think about how the geometry of the light and then the placement of the light is going to affect your application. That's why we have such variety in the marketplace. The marketplace understands that we need a wide variety of lights and are starting to deliver those to us off the shelf so that we can have the best possible application experience with those lights. So let's talk about these a little bit and some of the uh, issues, or I shouldn't say issues, but some of the characteristics, again, design characteristics of these lights in a real world application. One of the main things, uh, we've already covered, first of all, geometry. That's one of the main things. But one of the main remaining things as we think about the physical shape and the type of the light source is whether or not that light source is specular or diffused. Um, not to be confused, not to be confused with diffusion or uh, the diffuse nature of the parts we're shining the light on onto, but light sources themselves can deliver a point source or a hard source or a soft source of light. The thing to remember is that most light sources are by nature point sources. And what a lot of people don't understand is that an LED, which is a very, very popular type of lighting source today, is by nature a point source. Look at that image to the left. The LED in and of itself, and of course depending, uh, you may not know that the LED has an adjustable lens on the front of it, so when you get all these LEDs in a row or in a, an array, uh, actually you can usually specify the dispersion uh, angle of the LED itself. But the point being that an LED LED is by nature a point source. It produces a point of light. Of course, as you get further away from the light, you get a wider point and uh, you, you tend to get some diffusion of that light, particularly when the LEDs are spaced close together. However, what's the problem as we get further away? Oh, unfortunately, not enough light. We get an LED uh, 15 feet away from an object. It may be difficult to have that LED overcome ambient light. So the thing to remember is most light sources by nature are point sources. They're not diffuse. And by diffuse, I mean that they are not generating just a point in space. They're generating a broad, consistent illumination over a wide field of view. Question, what images would these ring lights that I'm showing here in the images produce on a mirror? I have nothing against these ring lights. I want you to understand how they will work in reflecting off of your object. If you reflect these onto a mirror, in all of these cases, from, from the angle where they're, intended to be, where they're intended to be mounted around the camera lens, you reflect these off a mirror. In the case of each one of these, you're going to get a single point reflection for each of the LEDs that's in that light. You're not going to get a nice consistent illumination over, this, uh, over the surface of that mirror. And that same thing will happen over a, any specular uh, or uh, reflective part that you try to use these lights with. What's a, uh, by the way, that doesn't mean that these lights aren't perfect for some application. But for applications where you have that specular uh, part, that reflective part, what's the alternative? The alternative is to move to a specular, uh, excuse me, a diffuse light sources, light source. Uh, we've already talked about these two items, but let, let me focus on soft light. In a light source, soft light is generated by using diffusers. These are objects in front of the light or reflection of the light off of a diffuse uh, object. 
knocked off of a diffuse surface. I'll direct your attention to the to the left here first. We see ring lights very similar to the ones we just looked at. In this case, though, the LEDs are buffered by a uh, diffusion plate that's in front of the LEDs. Now, these aren't necessarily perfect, but they do a great job of spreading that illumination over the entire surface of the ring. Same thing with this big panel illuminator, uh, where there are many LEDs behind it, but because of a diffuse surface on the front, these LEDs have their light uh, uh, buffered, again, over a wide area so that we get a wide area of consistent illumination. And just a quick mention to the image in the lower left there. That's an LED source. It looks a lot like a ring, uh, excuse me, a, like a fluorescent light. And actually, that's kind of what it is. It's a fluorescent light replacement. Uh, fluorescent lights, which I'm not going to recommend, we'll talk about in a second, I'm not going to recommend for machine vision, but they are useful. Why? They are the most natural diffuse illuminator that we have that we can plug into the wall and get, uh, get light out of. So many companies are providing lights that have, uh, that mimic a fluorescent light in its ability to provide a diffuse illumination over a, a long, narrow a scope, just like that bar light. What happens when we have a, a bright engine? I bet some of you listening to this today have come across this type of an application. We have a cylinder head here, or, excuse me, an engine block here. Uh, and of course, this is a machine surface, highly reflective, highly specular. How do we get light over that broad an area? We need it to cover what? A, a three, three feet square, perhaps, there. Uh, how are we going to get light over that broad an area without any dropouts, without any hot spots? One way is to use uh, a fixed diffuser and shine light onto that diffuser and let that reflect off the part. Pretty common way of doing things, and it has a lot of use in robotic guidance because we need often to illuminate a very wide area of field of view, and this is the way to do it without having arrays and arrays and arrays of lights above the part. So let's talk about these, uh, one last thing to talk about these uh, uh, illumination sources uh, in terms of their uh, physical shape and type, and in this case, how the light is produced. I'm going to start with LED illumination, probably the most popular way of illuminating objects today. LEDs are uh, widely available, available in a lot of colors. Um, they have a super, super long life. Uh, you wouldn't be uh, at all surprised to find an LED that you could leave on for 10,000 hours or longer and have it not degrade in intensity. Uh, they are able, you can able, you're able to structure them into a variety of shapes. Of course, as we all, we've already discussed, they may be specular or diffuse light. Of course, diffusing an LED requires an external device. And uh, we're not going to talk about this. This is more of an advanced subject, but the lights can be strobed at very high duty cycles and overdriven to many times their nominal current to get a high level of uh, illumination. There are other sources, of course, out there. One of my favorites is fluorescent. Um, one of the things with fluorescent lights, however, is that they are, they, uh, one of the good sides of fluorescent lights is they're super bright and highly diffuse, but the lighting can be inconsistent, number one. Uh, the fluorescent light loses um, its intensity and its uh, response very quickly within the first uh, couple thousand of hours, and then completely goes out after 3,000 hours. So it's something that has to be replaced on maybe even a monthly basis. Um, and fluorescent lights have three peaks of light that is not conducive to many uh, machine vision applications. They have a red, a green, and a blue peak uh, as opposed to a nice constant color, uh, color source. And then finally, fiber optic, tungsten halogen, uh, xenon. Uh, these are used more uh, consistently in uh, machine vision inspection applications, but uh, I wanted to point them out as being available. So what about this issue of intensity and color? I mentioned fluorescent lights. And here's a kind of confusing chart, and I'm not trying to confuse you, but I want you to understand this. And this, kind of, this is the kind of chart I have in my mind all the time when I'm thinking about machine vision illumination. What, is a, what does the sun do? Well, the, the fact is that over the visible spectrum, as you can see in that yellow light, the sun produces almost perfect illumination with a little bit of a peak in the uh, uh, 550, 580 nanometer range. Um, other light sources have significantly more limited responses. We can see the mercury light source in purple 
which is uh, unfortunately the light we see in a lot of, uh, up above in a lot of uh, plant floors, either mercury or uh, sodium uh, tungsten. It's moving towards, I understand, fluorescent and LEDs, but uh, this we see in a lot of plant floors. Mercury has a horrible uh, um, response being with it being peaks at uh, individual uh, wavelengths. A fluorescent light uh, has a uh, pretty bad response, as I said, peaks in three areas. Xenon, quartz tungsten, pretty good response, but not very useful for robotic guidance and machine vision. We see the response of a white LED. You see the big peak at blue. If you don't know this, a uh, white LED is actually made up of a blue LED that just energizes phosphors on the inside of its lens. And then finally, the red LED. I don't show IR illumination sources, and IR is a, a useful light source. We're not going to cover it in this uh, beginning, uh, beginning uh, class. So the thing I'm trying to point out from this chart is that, that um, you have to consider both the intensity and the color of the light that you're using. Uh, you may use monochromatic light, and we're going to talk about that right now. Well, first of all, I'm sorry, one last word about lighting uh, a light source, wavelength and frequency. Visible light runs pretty much between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers in, uh, in wavelength, uh, in, wa in, in wavelength. Um, of course, the, as you can see from this chart, and you should be intuitive, uh, frequency of the light increases, uh, excuse me, decreases with increasing wavelength. Um, I point this out only to show you that there are other lights besides what we use, and I mentioned IR, there are other lights besides what we use and even other electromagnetic spectrum that can be used with certain machine vision applications, ultraviolet, infrared, and so on. But it's important to remember the relationship of these lights. We'll be talking about color in just a minute. So how do we use color to our advantage? A lot of our LED sources are monochromatic. That means they, they deliver just a single color. Um, what does that mean to our applications? A lot of people kind of got used to in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s using just a good old red LED because that was the first LED invented uh, and it was cheap and easy to uh, obtain. Nowadays we can obtain most colors of LED uh, that are available in effectively and uh, pretty inexpensively. And so it's important for us to more and more understand monochromatic illumination for machine vision. Let's look at our color wheel there. Um, I'm showing a red and a green uh, light, a red and a green source. The red is the complement of the green. Let's see what that does on our stop sign. If we look in the middle, this is what we see uh, up at the top, uh, a, red, a red sign with white letters. Below, this is what a grayscale camera will see. However, if we illuminate it with red, what happens? Well, the red stop sign uh, delivers a lot of that red back to us and completely washes out the contrast, both to our eyes and to a machine vision system. If we deliver green, however, our eyes will see green reflected off the white because white reflects everything, but mostly a dark image reflected off, the, uh, off of the uh, um, red stop sign. So for a black and white image system, how do we create the best contrast, the best quality image? We'd use a green light with that red stop sign. It, it, uh, it just takes memorizing that color wheel or thinking about that color wheel when you consider what the best light is for your application. And don't use a red light when you're trying to create contrast on a red background. Here's a little bit different way to look at it. Uh, if we're shining white light at these pins and we want to differentiate the colors, we might um, use bandpass filters, and you can see what happens when we bandpass just the green light. A bandpass filter only allows one color of light through. If we only allow the green light through, the, the green appears white. If we only allow the red light through, the red appears white, and same thing for the blue. A way to achieve this as well without filters use an RGB source. There are RGB LEDs out there that will on demand deliver red, green, blue light or any combination in between. Great way to differentiate color or just to highlight the color that you want to uh, use as your uh, foreground feature. So how many LED colors are there? I get a lot of confusion of this. People say, well, I can get an LED in any color. You really can't. There are only a certain amount of, a certain amount of LEDs that can cr be created based on the physics of the silicon and uh, physics of the photodiode. And these are a list of what's available right now. Of course, including white, which we've already learned is a blue light. So let me finish this section with a bandpass filter. What if I want to reduce ambient light with my bandpass filter? 
I'm using, I may be able to use a red LED. You see over here in the right, uh, that curve that we saw earlier of the red LED and its response. If I put a limit on the light, uh, on the color that's returned to my camera by passing only that red frequency as indicated by those dotted lines, I'm only going to get that frequency of light back and no other light in the plant is going to come back. Where's the problem here? Well, one problem is notice that the sun also produces that, that wavelength of light. Now, we may be able to overcome the sun if our, localized, if our localized intensity of the red LED is sufficient to overcome just the ambient sunlight. But, of course, uh, we also have problems with a couple of other lights, and those light sources may be the kind of light that's above our head. Uh, question, what kind of light sources will still impact the imaging? Just gave you the answer. Sunlight, tungsten halogen, and xenon in this case, if we only limit to red there. So that's about all of the design characteristics that I can give you in the time we have allotted. Let's conclude by talking about some keys to successful lighting setup for IR vision, some things you should just take away, make a note of, uh, copy this presentation down, and re remember for all of these points with respect to the physics of lighting and these design considerations we've learned. Number one, overcome ambient illumination. You can't succeed if you don't overcome ambient illumination either by eliminating it, shrouding it, or filtering it as I just described so that you can have the dedicated lighting that you need for your application right above your application without the effects of ambient. You can overcome ambient light with intensity. We're going to talk about that. But how about this? Um, and this is probably the first time I've ever said this in a presentation, but I know what happens in robotic applications. You've got that 10-foot high robot, and you still need to find something in the, in the plant, on the plant floor. Maybe, and I don't advise it, but maybe, give in. Just add more broad area and ambient illumination over your cell. If you have a couple of fluorescent lights that are giving you just a hard time and creating hot spots due to reflection on the surface of your part, now that you know how that reflection works on the part and where the light is coming from to create the reflection, add more illumination up in the ceiling with more broad area ambient illumination to cover the part in the way you need covered. Danger, danger, of course. That light's not going to be consistent. It's not going to be on all the time, and it still doesn't overcome sunlight. But I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of an out. I'm not going to pound you about eliminating ambient illumination because there are times when we can't. But know the physics, know the design considerations, and apply them as you best see fit. Of course, bright lighting. It's, again, a problem, but we need brighter and brighter lighting to overcome the large standoff in robotic guidance applications. Uh, use the correct appropriate and appropriate wavelength of color for your application. We explained how light color impacts the resulting image, and I explained how you might be able to filter with a bandpass filter to get the proper color if needed. Of course, select the correct source and the correct type of light. If it's LED, correct the, uh, select the correct, correct geometry and put it in the right position, not just around the camera, but you may need a different position depending on your application. And select the type of source uh, appropriate to provide either point or diffuse, that's hard or soft illumination. A lot of, this is an area a lot of people forget. Um, even if you've bought that uh, ring light that, has a, that doesn't have a diffuser on it, be aware, you can go to the manufacturer and say, I'd like a diffuser for this ring light, and you can get a softer illumination if necessary. And finally, design your lighting system based on all this knowledge you have, and then finally, prove that it works. Design just plain doesn't work as a standalone with lighting. You need to actually get the lighting in hand, get the illumination in hand, experiment with your lighting design, and prove that it works not just on one part in the lab, but over a wide variety of parts and a wide variety of part presentation variations. I hope that helps. Oh, and how about the answer to illuminating the steel sphere? Challenging, very challenging. Let's see if you've got the right answer after listening to all our information. The reflection geometry of a steel sphere is very challenging because only 80 degrees might be illuminated 
at the top of the sphere. And you see what happens there at the, in the raw image up to the upper right uh, of the sphere. However, what's the correct answer for one of these, measurement or location? The correct answer is to use a dome light or a CDI, a constant diffuse illuminator. Uh, that image comes from Microscan, by the way. Um, and you'll get a perfect image because of the constant diffuse reflection off of that part, you'll get a perfect image of the sphere right at the tangent of its diameter. What if you want to pick it up for robotics? Do you need to do something that, uh, that uh, extreme? No, you don't. Uh, look at this ring light. A ring light generally centered over the, uh, over the part will always produce a circle at some reflection angle on, the tangent, on some tangent uh, above the hemisphere of the, of the ball bearing. So a ring light might be sufficient or a dome light with a center on it might be sufficient to pick up the part um, as well for uh, guidance and location. Hope you got the right answer to that. And speaking of answers, if you have any questions, I think Robert has a few that he's going to hand me. And I'll, uh, I'll go through these. I think we have a few, uh, few moments. First question is, is there a good way to use backlighting with additional lighting to highlight part features? Great. This engineer is really thinking outside the box, and uh, that's, a, that's a very good thing. Certainly, all of these lighting techniques can be combined, and in many cases should be combined, to get the best possible lighting. I've had many applications where both a backlight and then a discreetly placed front light or even a point spotlight out front uh, is used to uh, highlight surface features as opposed to just the, the uh, shadow or the outline of the part that would be delivered by backlighting. Uh, I can't tell you the best way to use it for your particular application, but keep keep going with that idea because um, you're going to uh, that that's the type of thinking that's really going to make your applications work and work well over a variety of uh, situations. What is the most versatile lighting source? Uh, uh, that's a Kind of a tricky question, uh, again, because it's application specific. If I, if I were to pick anything in today's marketplace, I guess I have to say um, uh, LED illumination. Uh, LED illumination has the ability to be, uh, first of all, it's, again, just a, a super long-lasting uh, illuminator. You can strobe it. You can create diffuse lighting uh, structures out of it. Uh, it's inexpensive. Um, the only downside to LED lighting for most uh, applications, particularly when they're not strobed for overdriving, and we can talk about that in offline or in a, in a uh, future webinar, uh, is that they have uh, a fairly low lumen output relative to some other light sources. It's getting better and better and better, and some of these fluorescent uh, replicators in LEDs are actually very high output and may be sufficient for most of your applications if you need a diffuse source. And one more question. What's a good example of using a polarized lens? Good question. Uh, and a little bit of an advanced topic, but I want to address it right now. Um, I'm sorry I don't have a slide for that. Um, and again, I considered it more of an uh, advanced application, uh, an advanced topic. Um, maybe later on we will get to a, a lighting too and, and go over a few of these more advanced issues. Let me talk about polarizers because there's a lot of confusion about a polarizer. Uh, a polarizer is a diffraction grating that's placed in front of the light and in front of the camera. You get very little value out of a polarizer if you just polarize the light going into the lens or the light coming out of a light source. The purpose of a polarizer is to line up, essentially, I'm going to oversimplify it here for sake of time. The purpose of a polarizer is to line up the uh, rays of light in a hor well, a horizontal or vertical or basically in line with the diffraction grating that's in front of the source. And then that information gets decoded by the diffraction grating in front of the lens. Uh, the way you use a polarizer, one way, I take it back, one way to use a polarizer is to eliminate, in certain cases, uh, specular reflection from a light source or from, a, better yet, from an ambient light source. But here's the problem. Oh, well, before I tell you the problem, here's the good news. It works great. If you polarize the light source and polarize the, uh, the 
lens, it put a polarizer in front of the lens and adjust those to the optimal uh, encoding of the, uh, the lights through the diffraction grating and decoding through the receiving diffraction grating, you can pretty much eliminate any constant specular reflection that comes off of a part. Here's the problem. Many parts don't have constant reflection as we've described. Take, for example, the issue of a machined part with, with the machining uh, marks on the surface of the part. Uh, if th those machining marks are presented in the same angle at the same time always, a pol you could use a polar polarizer, a transmitter and a receiver polarizer, to eliminate the machining marks from the surface of the part. However, uh, machining marks uh, rarely, in my experience, stay in the same place on the surface of the part. Uh, they are sometimes horizontal, sometimes vertical, sometimes at an angle, and there's, therein lies the problem. We uh, just don't have, uh, you would have to change the angle of the polarizer for every angle of machine mark in order to eliminate the specular reflection from those machine marks. So I wouldn't overthink the idea of the pro, uh, polarizer. And I uh, would take caution in using a polarizer or expecting it to solve all your problems. But very good advanced technique. It certainly can have uh, benefit uh, given the specific application. 